Well, it's always there. Yes, we're well, crazy there. <laughs> <laughs> Yes, okay, welcome uh, everyone to the thesis defense of David. David is a sixth year graduate student uh, in my group. He's been doing some very intense um, layered experiments. Uh, so you see from the title, you know, walking through all those uh, pieces. So as I said, David's been here for six years. He came from the Ohio State University. Uh, well, we'll talk together. Thanks, Beverly. <coughs> Hello, thanks for uh, joining me. At my thesis defense on tax day. Um, <laughs> today I'm going to be talking about the spatial temporal response of a compliant wall turbulent boundary layer system um, to dynamic roughness forcing. And as most thesis titles are, this is quite a mouthful, but there are three main elements here. We have a turbulent boundary layer, we have this compliant wall, and then a dynamic roughness. And I want to start this talk by unpacking each of those terms. And first, I'd like to um, acknowledge the support of the day at OSR as well as the on for this work. So let's start with the turbulent boundary layer. We have boundary layer flow. Anytime we have a fluid that's moving relative to some wall or boundary, and friction brings the relative velocity of the fluid to zero right at the wall, and then through the action of viscosity, we get in the uh, until it eventually achieves the through stream condition. And we get this flow in all sorts of applications. For example, we can think of this wall as being the wing of an aircraft or the hull of a ship. And in these engineering applications, the flow almost always becomes turbulent, which is this chaotic flow state of enhanced mass, momentum, and thermal mixing. And these things lead to a dramatic increase in skin friction drag. Uh, for example, up to 50% of the total drag on a commercial aircraft can be attributed to turbulent boundary layers. So we clearly want to be able to understand this turbulent phenomenon, but it's made quite complex by this chaotic and almost random nature. Uh, and so one foothold that a great deal of research has taken is the idea of coherent structures. And so within this chaotic flow, we have regions of spatially and temporally coherent flow. So we have this image on the right here of a turbulent boundary layer, and you can see these large bulges that have formed, and bulges like this are very characteristic of turbulent flows. So some coherent structures have been found to play a role in the self-sustaining nature of turbulence, while others have been found to be energetically and dynamically significant. And so if we can understand the mechanisms behind these coherent structures, perhaps we can develop a backbone understanding of this complex turbulent phenomenon. And with that understanding, what we want to do is ultimately develop flow control mechanisms to modify and mitigate some of these effects from this type of flow. So many flow control schemes have been studied, and the one that I want to focus on today is this idea of compliant surfaces, which is simply a surface that can deform under and potentially modify the surrounding flow. And the seminal work by Kramer was inspired by dolphins. Kramer observed that as dolphins swim, their skin forms ripples and can actually deform under the flow, and he thought that this compliance may be part of why dolphins can swim so efficiently. So many studies were inspired by this and followed Kramer. Um, so the work is reviewed by Gadahak, who himself did studies on the types of instability waves that you can get in the surfaces in this type of flow. However, maybe not a huge surprise, it turns out designing these compliant surfaces to achieve turbulent drag reduction is hard. And that is in part because there's a very large parameter space. There's almost a limitless amount of materials that one could test. And then you also have this complexity from the broadband spectrum of turbulence in addition to the complex interaction with the surface itself. So it's difficult to see what parts of the flow are interacting with what parts of the surface. And so it's very challenging to design some surface to have a beneficial or favorable interaction. Um, however, there is uh, one of many robust observations, which is that the interaction with the compliant surface and the coherent structures in the flow is very key to the efficacy of that surface. So we ask ourselves, can we leverage this idea of a coherent structure to study a compliant surface flow in a more reduced and directed manner? And that leads us in turn to dynamic roughness. Dynamic roughness is simply a wall roughness element that's temporally activated, as is shown in this movie here, with some frequency omega f. And this type of roughness was studied in our group previously. Jacoby and McKeon found that dynamic roughness forces this 
highly amplified spatial temporal mode, or essentially a traveling wave into the flow. And it can be well characterized by a wave number vector. We have kx, kz, and omega, which are streamwise and spanwise wave numbers, and a temporal frequency. The Bruning can then use this synthetic scale from the dynamic roughness and study the interaction with it and the coupled small scales. And the interaction that they observed reflected the type of interaction you get between the scales that naturally occur in turbulence. And so what we want to do is take this synthetic scale that's generated by dynamic roughness and use it to study the interaction between our turbulent boundary layer and our compliant surface. By generating this deterministic input, we can study this problem in a more direct input-output manner. So, after all that, we finally unpack the title of this talk, and we can start discussing the work itself. Um, so here, I have a presentation of the outline which follows the chapters of my thesis. We've just discussed the motivation. I'll go through the experimental methodology that was developed. Um, we'll actually skip the facility characterization so that we can jump straight into the results of this work. And then I'll close with some conclusions and future work. So for the experimental methodology, that includes the apparatus design and the measurement techniques and the analysis tools that were developed in order to perform this study. Um, so we want to study flat plate boundary layers. And so we first need a flat plate facility, which is what's shown here. This is the multi-section acrylic plate that was designed. Um, designed with this midsection able to be removed uh, and replaced by a midsection that's been designed for the current phase of the experiment. Um, and so we take that plate and we, we design a, a mechanism to suspend it in our NOAA water tunnel test section. This is where all the experiments are done, in our water tunnel downstairs. And once we characterize this facility, we then develop our dynamic roughness apparatus. So the type of roughness we study here is a two-dimensional thin rib like that, and we, we insert it into our mid plate section that has this receiving inset. So you can see here how the two fit together, the roughness element slots into that slot um, in the plate. And then this roughness element is actuated very precisely by a Bose motor, uh, illustrated here, and it's suspended over our water tunnel and connected to our roughness element, and a significant amount of work was put into the full alignment of this apparatus to make sure that we don't get any vibration transmission between the motor and the plate. So once we characterize the dynamic roughness apparatus, we can then take advantage of the fact that we are in a water tunnel versus previous studies which were done in a wind tunnel. And what that means is we have longer flow time scales, and that gives access to higher non-dimensional frequencies, um, which means we should expect smaller or shorter synthetic structures. And this is somewhat of a trade-off. So we get smaller structures, which means we can study them spatially more, using PID, which I'll discuss shortly. Um, but the trade-off is that we operate at a lower level somewhere. So with that characterized, characterized, we then move to the compliant surface implementation. So here in the plate section, we have a large well that's been carved out that's, um, to mold our compliant surface. A little bit about our compliant material. We have selected gelatin as our surface, um, and that's because it's nearly linearly elastic. It's also quite inexpensive, and I'll say it's simple to cook. It's not so simple to mold, uh, as I'll show in a second. And it can also be made very soft, which is useful when we want to get this deformation from the surface, uh, <laughs> from the flow. Um, so after that, we then did some basic characterizations of our material properties. We were able to estimate a Young's modulus, and then we assumed that the material was incompressible, which let us estimate a shear wave speed of the gelatin, which is an important material property. Um, and then we, we developed a fabrication and a molding process, as well as a speckling technique that allowed us to generate the speckle pattern on the surface, and it actually allows us to measure those surface definitions um, in a manner that I'll describe in a second. And here, I just kind of want to highlight one of the challenges um, in doing compliant surface work. So a great deal of effort was taken to make the surface as, as flush and as flat as possible. But you can see in this image of the surface, it's not quite either of those two. So the y-axis is definitely not true to scale. We have this large variation on the surface of about 0.8 millimeters, and that's over the span of 150 millimeters. So this is not super visible to the eye, but it's, it's definitely there. And this is something that happens with many compliant surface studies. It's difficult to completely avoid any imperfections in the surface. 
But one nice thing here is that we have that deterministic input from the dynamic roughness, and that really enables what we'll be talking about later in this presentation. Okay, so the measurement techniques that are employed here are both phase locked to the roughness actuation, so that we can phase out to the data later. To measure the flow field, we're doing two dimensional particle image velocimetry. And then to measure the surface, we'll actually get all three deformation components using stereo image, uh, stereo digital image correlation, or DIC. So for the PID, we're using two cameras in this very non traditional knife edge configuration. Um, and this is so that we can optimize our field of view. And then in the stereo case, we also use two cameras there just off the normal axis relative to the compliance surface here. And that's so that we get this stereo information and can capture the out of plane deformation of the surface. So these are our measurement techniques. And just want to give a quick recap for the experiment. We have this turbulent boundary layer that we are developing over the plate. And then we have a two dimensional dynamic roughness element that forces this synthetic mode into the flow. And what we want to see is that there is an interaction with this compliant sample that's embedded in our plate. We make flow measurements using PID and surface measurements with DIC. And we're also performing a parameter sweep. So for example, we alternate our um, actuation frequency as well as our actuation amplitude to see what the effects are on these parameters um, for the synthetic structure. And something I want to point out here is that the goal of this work is not to see something like turbulent drag reduction. Rather, what we want is to get a measurable surface response to this synthetic mode that we're making. We want there to be an interaction for us to study, and then we can build an understanding, sort of start from a fundamental viewpoint and build up to complexity in the future. Okay, and one last thing. Um, some of the analysis tools that we're using here to look at the data. Um, we're doing a triple decomposition following Hussein and Reynolds, and you can understand this from sort of a simple example. Um, this is what we might see if we were to take a wall normal slice in our PID and look at our velocity field. Uh, we have the velocity is high away from the wall and gradually goes to zero, as discussed before. And doing a typical Reynolds decomposition, you would separate this into a temporal mean component, which captures the average shape of that velocity, and then you would get this fluctuating component about that mean. But because of dynamic roughness, we are putting in a very particular frequency. And so we can extract that frequency using a phase average. So when we phase average, we get this phase average velocity, u tilde, and then we get a new fluctuation about the temporal mean plus that phase average. And you can kind of see visually that if you were to add all three of these components up, you would recover that full velocity. So we'll be focusing on this phase average velocity field, and we will also employ a discrete Fourier analysis. So here, a DFT in time is very much natural from a phase average perspective. And what it lets us do is separate all our harmonic components of our forcing frequency. Um, and so what we're going to be looking at in particular is the component that corresponds to our forcing frequency exactly. We're going to remove the higher harmonics from this. And then later in this talk, we'll see that we can characterize the spatial structure, the synthetic mode as well. And so when we do that, we're able to do a DFT in X in the streamwise direction because we have two dimensional PID data. Um, and so when we do that, we can not only extract the temporal Fourier coefficient, but actually this full spatial temporal Fourier coefficient when we have captured this omega f and this ks f content as well. And just as a notational mention, uh, a single half is going to indicate a DFT in time, and a double half will indicate a DFT in space and time. Okay, now we are finally equipped to discuss some of these results. And when we think about it, there are sort of two elements of complexity in this experiment. We have the dynamic roughness, which we have on or off, or we have the um, compliant surface for a smooth wall. So we're going to add each of these together one at a time. We'll look first at the case of dynamic roughness alone, the smooth wall, in order to understand the synthetic mode and to contribute to some of the previous work. <laughs> Next, we'll look at the compliant wall without dynamic roughness to understand what the natural surface response is to the turbulent boundary layer system. And then finally, we're going to put the two together and look at the compliant wall with dynamic roughness forcing in order to confirm that we are indeed getting a surface response from our synthetic mode and flow. And then lastly, we're going to be taking a look at the smooth wall and the compliant wall, um, the flows in both of those cases, in order to try to understand what the effect of that compliant wall is. 
Okay, so let's dive in with the smooth wall dynamic roughness force system. And we're going to start by looking at these phase average velocity fields. In particular, we're looking at that forcing frequency component. So on top here, we have U, the streamwise velocity, bottom is V, the one-one velocity, flow is going left to right, and here, red indicates a positive perturbation, blue indicates a negative perturbation. So the first thing we see is that there is definitely a spatially coherent structure in both of these flow components. Something is definitely getting picked out by this forcing frequency. We can see that U, it has this sort of four-lobe structure and undergoes this phase jump as we move in Y. What that means is on top of a positive blob, this is a negative blob, and then vice versa, on top of a negative blob, we have a positive blob. And in contrast to that, we have a very tall structure in V, um, and it just alternates positive to negative in the streamlined direction. In addition to this, we can see that U and V have a 90-degree phase shift relative to one another. And this is very much reminiscent of the generation of vortex sheets. And we can better visualize this by looking at some of the other data that were acquired. So this data were acquired on the center line or flat plane. But we also acquire data off center line in parallel planes. And what we can do is take the data from all those different planes and interpolate them and take a look at the three-dimensional structure of this synthetic mode. So what's plotted here in these movies are isosurfaces of the spanwise vorticity, um, red being positive and blue being negative vorticity. And what we can see is that as the dynamic roughness actuates, it's generating these alternating positive and negative sheets or tubes of vorticity. And as these tubes come back downstream, they get sheared by the flow and get thinned out. You can see this bottom view. But one important observation from this data is that if we look along the z equals zero, this is our center line, we can see that the structure is essentially two-dimensional. There isn't a great deal of three-dimensionality going on here. And this is something that was assumed in previous studies and something that we'll assume moving forward. Um, and it seems pretty natural given the two-dimensional roughness element that we use. But this is now an experimental confirmation in data that this assumption is valid. And it does see, you can see that the structure certainly decays as we move downstream. If I were to select a lower isosurface value, you would see that these, this two-dimensional structure persists for a very large portion of the domain. So moving back to our boring 2D data, uh, we have those movies from before that corresponded to a particular Fourier coefficient, which means we can look at the amplitude and the phase of those 2D Fourier mode shapes. And so that's what we have here. On top, we have the amplitude mode shape, and on the bottom, we have the phase. And when we look at the amplitude, what we see is that the perturbation is very strong near the roughness and then gradually decreases as it convects downstream, which is somewhat intuitive. We see this in U and V. But in addition to that, we see that the structures also drift away from the wall gradually following this power law fit. And this is consistent with observations that were made previously by Jacobi and McKeon of internal layer structures in these rough um, boundary layer flows. Um, one other detail that you can see from this is that in addition to decaying, there's this sort of sinuous pattern on top of that decay rate, this sort of modulation. And this is a telltale sign of amplitude modulation. And this is discussed more in the thesis, but I just want to highlight that this is an observation that you could only make by having sufficiently resolved data that we do here. Um, looking at the bottom plots in the phases, you can see this phase jump in U is represented here as well. You can actually see the line delineates these near wall um, structures from the far wall. And then again, as we had observed before, V instead seems to be very tall and have nearly constant phase in the wall normal direction. So something that we can do is, for example, take a slice in the phase of V going along X and take a look at what the phase is doing in the straight direction. What is that behavior? And when we do that, we have this plot on the left and we see that it's essentially a linear relationship with X. And we can leverage this by considering a single traveling wave. So if we imagine that V is simply some E to the I KX minus omega T, which is a simple traveling wave, you look at the temporal Fourier coefficient and you get that it's an E to the I KX form. Some basic complex analysis tells us that the amplitude is then constant in this case one, and that the phase, the argument of this coefficient, is linear in X. And if we can estimate that slope, estimate the slope of that linear relationship, 
that gives us the streamwise wave number or correspondingly the streamwise wavelength of our synthetic structure. And we apply this at a particular slice along y. We can do that for all slices along y. And what we find is that it has a nearly constant value for all these wall normal locations and then starts to deviate very near the wall. So in short, what we've developed is a machinery to extract the, the spatial structure corresponding to a particular synthetic mode. And we can plug this machinery, we can plug our data through this machinery um, and do this for all our different parametric conditions. And so we get the values that are shown in this table on the right. And if we do a parametric study, so we take a look at the data as we vary the frequency, that's what's plotted in this plot here. So we have the data from this experiment in blue, and then actually I'm plotting the data from a previous study, Dubrui and McKeon, and I want to point out that this is done in a wind tunnel at different flow conditions and also different motor actuation conditions. And despite that, we see that all the data seem to lie on the same linear relationship. So we can do a fit to get this linear relationship, and we find um, this expression. So what this is doing is giving us kx as a function of our forcing frequency. And this is actually a very useful, useful relationship for dynamic roughness, because what it means we can do is we can pick a synthetic length scale that we want to target, pick a particular scale that we want, and this tells us what forcing frequency we should use to achieve that. And clearly, you know, there is some validity both in our water tunnel as well as in our wind tunnel. And this relationship is something that we did not have before and hopefully will sort of add value to dynamic roughness as a tool in the future. So all said and done, what we, what we have is a nice framework, a way to process the data from our velocity fields. And we're going to use that later in this talk. Now we're going to switch gears and look at what happens with our compliant wall without dynamic roughness. So as mentioned, we have DIC data. We have all three deformation components. We have DX, DY, uh, Z deformations. And on top of that, we have this data in three different fields of view. So we acquire data. Here's sort of a top-down view of our gelatin sample. We acquire data in a leading edge, corner, and trailing edge field of view. We can calculate a temporal power spectra and then do a spatial average in each field of view to get sort of an average power spectrum for each field of view. And so that's what I'm showing in this plot here. These are the power spectra of the wall normal deformation for each different field of view. And this is discussed a lot more in the thesis, but I kind of want to point out a punchline here, which is that from these plots, we can identify several spectral features that have a mean amplitude on the order of one to five microns, which is very small, especially relative to our boundary layer thickness. Um, but it is still um, resolvable given the DIC uncertainty that we have. And another observation that we have from this is that the wall normal deformation dy is very prominent in many of these spectral features. And so moving forward, we will focus solely on this dy component of the deformation. So now that we have these power spectra from which we can characterize these features, we're going to look at the compliant wall now with dynamic rough distortion. And looking at the spectra, here we have in red the unforced spectrum, and then in blue we have the forced spectrum. And we see that for the most part, the, the, the spectra are fairly similar. There's definitely some difference in the low frequencies, which again is discussed in the thesis. But the most prominent difference is this peak in the roughness force case that's occurring right at our forcing frequency, which is five hertz here. So what this is saying is that the energy that we have, are putting in through dynamic roughness is living right at that forcing frequency and doesn't seem to be modifying the spectra uh, a great deal otherwise. So what we can do is do the same thing we did with our PID data and extract the forcing frequency component, um, which is shown here. So this is the wall normal deformation that is coherent with our forcing frequency. And what you can see is there's some sort of large beating. So doing uh, simple subtractions of this, we can highlight what we see here, which is this nearly two-dimensional, almost spanwise constant deformation wave. And these waves travel strictly downstream. Um, just like our synthetic structure in the flow. So these waves have a mean amplitude of about 1.8 microns, which is on a similar scale to our other spectral features. Um, but importantly, the spatial structure of this mode is very much distinct from the other spectral features that we saw in the unforced response. What this means is that 
really nothing else can be causing this surface response except some interaction with that synthetic mode in the flow. So this is res a response to what we have put in, and this is confirmation of that. And I will totally admit that when I saw this plot come up on screen, I definitely jumped up and down and laughed because this was something that we had not demonstrated before and weren't really, I wasn't really sure what we were going to see. So this confirms that our flow is interacting with our surface. Now can we see if it goes the other way and our surface has affected our flow? Um, and that's what we're going to do by comparing what we have in a smooth wall case with our compliant wall flow. Okay, so the simplest comparison to do is a visual one. Um, and he had the movies that we showed before. So on the top, we have our streamwise velocity perturbation. On the bottom, we have our um, wall normal velocity. <clears throat> and then here in one and three, we have the smooth wall modes. Two and four are the compliant wall modes. Um, and I think the first thing that strikes me is the fact that these modes are very much visually similar. The modes in U both have this four lobe structure with that phase jump in Y, while B in both cases stands very tall. <clears throat> so the fact that these structures have uh, sort of visually resemble one another is useful in the sense that that machinery that we built to extract that streamwise length scale from the board, we can apply it to our compliant wall data as well, which is good. Um, and there is a difference that you can notice if you focus on the downstream end over here, you can see that the smooth wall mode starts to take a slight lead over the compliant wall mode. And we're going to see why that is on the next slide. So we take this processing that we've developed and just plug our compliant wall data through as well. And when we plot that same parametric study, we have the compliant wall data in the orange over on the left here. What we see is that for every frequency that was tested, we have the compliant, uh, the compliant wall supporting a higher streamwise wave number. Um, what this means is that in the compliant wall case, the synthetic structure is, is shorter than x. So a higher kx gives you a lower uh, lambda x. And this translates to our wave speed as well. We have that the smooth wall wave speed is then greater than our compliant wall wave speed, which is exactly what we saw in those movies as the smooth wall mode started to lead over the compliant wall a bit. Um, and some possible reasons for this, there's certainly the difference that the wall is now compliant, um, but there's a non-trivial difference in the surface geometry as well that was discussed earlier. Um, and these effects as well as others may lead to some sort of modification to the sort of background mean flow. And that could be altering the uh, synthetic length scale that's being selected in the system. <clears throat> so this parametric comparison is nice, but we would certainly like to be able to do a more detailed comparison. In particular, we want to be able to compare the spatial temporal Fourier modes um, that we have developed this machinery for. However, the fact that the smooth and the compliant wall flow flows look so visually similar is somewhat difficult for us to handle because now it might be tough to discern what details it is that we're, we're searching for. Um, so what we'd like to do is have some prediction, or some model that can guide our analysis. And for that, we'll be using the resolvent framework developed by McKean and Sharma and extended by Luhar et al. as a lens through which to view these results. So then I'd like to briefly discuss um, the resolvent analysis. So here uh, we have our Nagar Stokes equations and we're going to Fourier transform them and rearrange the terms so that we have the velocity u on the left and then our pesky nonlinear term here on the right. And then in between them we have this operator h, this is our resolvent operator. And we're gonna call that nonlinear term f. So this is a mode by mode analysis, which means that we have to make a selection of the wave number vector that we're considering. And this is convenient because we're, later we're just going to plug in the synthetic mode wave number that we have in the experiment. So if we look at these equations, what we're saying is that we have some term f that acts to force this velocity u, and it acts through h, which is the resolvent operator. However, if we look back at the first one of the equation, we see that u then comes back and is related to f through this nonlinear term. In fact, we have the interaction of uh, different wave numbers here as well that are triadically consistent with okay. <clears throat> And so writing this full loop out, we have not assumed anything away. We have a full representation of Nagar Stokes. Um, and yeah, we have not made any simplifications yet. But now we're going to take a look, rather than looking at the entire loop, we're going to focus just on the resolving operator and see that we know many of its components. We know the, the governing equations are linear component of the Nagar Stokes. 
We know our flow geometry, which is our boundary condition. And the mean velocity profile is not known a priori, but we can, we can get from an experiment or a simulation if we do that. Then we have everything that goes as a result of an operator, and we can construct it. We can construct H. And so I'm not going to go through this next part in too much detail. But once we have H, we can perform a singular value decomposition and decompose H into a singular response mode, singular forcing mode, and singular value. And then one powerful result of Kian Sharma and others is that this operator H, for many physically significant wave number vectors, is low rank, which means its first singular value is much bigger than the other singular values. And so we can do this rank one approximation of H and approximate it by its first singular modes and that first singular value. And when we couple this with a broadband forcing assumption, we can actually estimate, we can approximate our velocity. In particular, if we only care about the mode shape, which is all we care about in this study, we can approximate U by just looking at that first singular response mode. And so I'm going to call this psi from now on geometry. And if we can somehow get our hands on a mean profile, we track this resolving mode that lets us predict what the shape of the velocity may take. <clears throat> And so in particular, we're going to use this resolvent framework that was extended by Luhar et al. to consider not just a rigid wall, but now a compliant wall. And so that compliant wall is modeled as a spring damper backed plate boundary condition that gets linear us. And in the process of doing this, they introduced this complex wall admittance term Y, which is basically a relationship between the wall normal velocity at the wall and the pressure at the wall. And so here what we're going to do is we're going to consider a resolvent code for channel geometry as opposed to a boundary layer geometry, and that's for some numerical convenience. But we did a cursory study with a boundary layer code as well and found very similar results. Then we need to make that selection of the wave number vector. And so here we're going to choose um, ones that actually reflect our experiment. So the smooth wall Kx is going to be lower than our compliant wall Kx to reflect the fact that we have a longer structure in the smooth wall case. However, they'll have the same forcing frequency and the same kz equals zero. And then we're going to assume that our material is purely elastic. In other words, we have no damping. And when we plug in our material values, we get a y of 0 0.003. Y is purely imaginary when we neglect damping. And finally, we need that mean profile. <clears throat> and here, what we're going to use is actually one generated by an eddy viscosity model, which means that it's going to be uncontrolled and numerically generated. Now, we have experimental means from our experimental data, but that would require a pretty careful interpolation scheme and might require some additional assumptions on the data. And so rather than do that, we're going to start with this eddy viscosity model as sort of a, a nice, simple place to start, see how well we do, and then one could extend this further later. So with all that, <clears throat> this is set up in MATLAB, I'll run it on my Google laptop, it takes half a second to generate a set of resolving modes, which is much less time than it took me to run the experiments. So if we can get something useful out of this, uh, it has my vote for sure. <laughs> um, okay, and I want to take a little bit more time before we dive into the results to actually talk about the interpretation of what this compliant boundary condition is doing in the resolvent framework. So for a purely imaginary surface, we have, again, that that wall admittance term is purely imaginary and the coefficient is positive. So if we look at the form of y, again, it's this relationship between v and p. And some simple complex analysis tells us that if y is purely imaginary, that we have to have this phase condition between v and p. Namely, that the phase difference between these two has to be positive pi over 2. And this occurs at the wall. <clears throat> but if we combine this with what we know from previous resolvent studies, we know that the phase difference between v and p is actually minus pi over 2 away from the wall. And what's more, we know that the phase of P is essentially constant all the way down to the wall. So if we combine these pieces of information, we have some phase relationship at the wall, a different one away from the wall, and P cannot help us achieve that boundary condition. That means V has to do the work. This means that V must undergo a pi phase jump as it approaches the wall. And what a pi or 180 degree phase jump is, is simply a, a change in sign of V. And so what the elastic wall is doing is it's generating a V at the wall in opposition to the V away from the wall. So visually what this is, 
is if we have this V structure sitting up here, then what the ball is doing is generating a V in opposition to this. So we have positive away and negative and vice versa. And now a little bit uh, more math, if we have positive up here and it goes to negative or negative to positive, this means that V must achieve zero somewhere in the middle. And where V equals zero, we essentially have some wall feature, this virtual wall that stands above the actual wall. And this virtual wall is exactly what is observed in a different type of flow control study called opposition control. <clears throat> in fact, Uvar et al. did an opposition control study using resolvent analysis, and what they found were these mode shapes. And this is the signature of that virtual wall that we just discussed. So here we have the mode amplitude, and if we look at what happens when we turn opposition control on, we develop this local minimum or a cusp in the amplitude. And right where that cusp occurs, we get this pi phase jump in the mode as well. And so this is exactly the same as what we would expect out of this compliant boundary condition. And so we want to keep an eye out as we look at our resolve modes and see if we have this signature from opposition control in our case as well. <coughs> okay, enough math, let's look at some plots. <clears throat> we're going to do a smooth versus compliant wall comparison, and we're going to start looking at those spatial temporal reporting modes along with the resolvent modes. And that's what we have here. This is our streamwise velocity. Um, and so in the top, we have our mode amplitudes, top left. In the bottom, we have our mode uh, phases. And if we take a look at the general structure of this mode shape, you see that it's dual peaks. For you, we have a peak and a peak further from the wall. This is reflecting that two load structure that we saw in you earlier, in the earlier movies. And we see that right in the middle of those two peaks, we're undergoing that phase jump. And so that is what we saw before when we went from positive to negative and vice versa. We see that the smooth and compliant walls, which are blue and orange respectively, they have a very similar shape. They both have this dual peak nature, but there's definitely this shift that's occurring. The smooth mode is shifted relative to the um, compliant mode. And we can understand this from a, a critical layer mechanism. So the critical layer occurs where the mean profile is equal to the phase speed of our mode. And we know that the phase speed of our smooth wall is higher than the phase speed of our compliant wall, which means that the critical layer sits higher for the smooth wall case and is lower for the compliant wall case. And that's what's plotted here. These dashed lines represent the critical layer location. So we can see there's a shift in the critical layers, and that seems to correspond well with the shift in our modes themselves. And that's the case in the phase too. And before we move on, I want to point out that our resolving modes here seem to predict the general features and characteristics of our experimental modes quite well. We have that same dual peak structure, and it also captures this critical layer shifting behavior because we informed it um, through the, the wave number selection. Okay, so this has been you. Now we can look at the wall normal velocity V. And again, from those movies, we saw that V is big and tall, and that's what we're seeing in this mode shape. It's a single peak, and it's quite tall. Um, again, we see that there's a critical layer shift between the, the smooth and compliant modes. <clears throat> and when we look at the phase, here's again that constant phase corresponding to that tall structure in V. But as we get closer, and here we make a comparison with resolvent. We can see that indeed resolvent also is exhibiting a very large deviation in the phase, but in this case it's in the opposite sense. So, and so the first thing I want to point out is in the resolving modes. We can see this cusp feature in the amplitude. We see the jump in the phase. These are exactly the same signature as the virtual wall from the opposition control. And again, this is due to that elastic boundary. <clears throat> but it appears to not be so prominent or present at all. When we look at our experimental mode, we certainly don't see that same cusp type behavior. And again, though we do see that there's some significant phase variation, it's not in the same sense excuse me, as what we see in the resolvent. So we definitely need to be careful. We don't expect our resolvent modes to perfectly match our experimental modes. However, there are also some reasons why we might not see this virtual wall feature in our experiment, <clears throat> or at least not in our, our Fourier emojis. And some of those reasons are, for example, the feature is expected to be very near the wall, which is one of the more challenging places for PID because we have a very sharp uh, gradient. <clears throat> Perhaps more dominantly, we have this wall varying, this varying wall location, which was addressed earlier. We have this non-trivial surface geometry. And then on top of that, we have other deformations. 
that we are talking about here. We have deformations that are at different frequencies, and even at the same frequency, we have deformations that aren't in traveling wave style. It could be large vibration type. And so what all this tells us is that a subtle near wall feature might not get picked out from a Fourier analysis, which essentially assumes a parallel flow. So what we can do instead is maybe circumvent some of these deficiencies in the data by considering a different analysis. <clears throat> we can instead look to compare the smooth and compliant wall cases through a conditional average approach. And so we can think about what kind of conditional average would make sense here. This virtual wall signature is very prominent in that V mode, and again, it's characterized by this cusp in the amplitude. Um, and so what we can do is make a condition off the amplitude of V, in particular, it's near wall gradient. Look for a left leaning V mode and see if there are any profiles that satisfy this. And if we look, indeed, we find some. <clears throat> Zooming in close to the wall, we see that, yes, we have this negative leaning, but here we have to pause and be careful because with conditional averaging, you will only find what you look for. And so in order to make sure that there is some significance to this, we can apply this condition to our smooth wall and our compliant wall data. And for the smooth wall, we see that 10% of the profiles satisfy this condition. And at the, with the compliant wall data, this jumps to 64%, which is definitely a statistically significant increase. This suggests to us that there's something going on, something is changing when we add the compliant wall to modify this behavior. And so that gives us some confidence to move forward with this compliant, uh, with this conditional averaging. And what we'll do is we'll take our profiles and shift them so that the cusp position align. And then we'll stamp and do our conditional averaging. So that's what I'm showing here. These are our conditionally averaged modes now. So this is our U modes, and these are our V modes. And again, we see the same dual peak structure in U, the same tall peak, the tall structure in V. And that's to be expected. We're not changing too much. <clears throat> but what we are changing is looking for something near the wall. And when we zoom in, now a virtual wall feature is indeed revealed. In fact, if we look at it, Again, it's revealed because we looked for it. But if we compare it to what we expect in the resolvent prediction, we see that it has many of the characteristics that this resolvent mode does as well, um, even its relative amplitude to the smooth wall case. And so this gives us confidence that we do have some kind of virtual wall feature in our flow. Um, and that allows us to interpret the action of our compliant surface as opposing that near wall velocity. Okay, so this was a whole bunch of data and a whole bunch of analysis. I'm gonna do a quick recap. Um, <clears throat> so we looked at our synthetic flow structures and found that they're quite similar visually with the compliant wall mode being slightly shorter than the smooth wall mode. We then did a resolvent analysis and found this signature of a virtual wall um, in both the, the mode amplitude and the mode phase. And we used this to sort of anticipate what kind of difference we would see in our data. <clears throat> then we took a look at our Fourier mode shapes and, and saw that the smooth and compliant wall had a very similar mode shape structure, this dual peak and U, and this tall V structure, as well as exhibiting this critical layer shift um, in both of them, both also well captured by the resolvent predictions. However, this virtual wall feature was not present in our Fourier modes. Um, and as discussed, this may be due to some of the deficiencies in the data. And so we used a different conditionally averaged approach and we're able to reveal that virtual wall feature. And it allows us to interpret the action of our elastic surface as opposing this near wall V, just the way uh, position control does. Okay, now I'd like to provide some conclusions and discuss a bit of future work. Here we have studied an elastic compliant surface, interact experiment, um, and designed phase locked flow and surface measurements. And we also developed um, processing through the, uh, the analysis of the data. We were able to make some contributions to dynamic roughness understanding by developing this spatial description of the flow. We were able to confirm the two dimensionality of this flow structure, uh, as well as observe some amplitude modulation and, and develop this empirical relationship between the streamwise length scale of the flow and that forcing frequency, and should hopefully give dynamic roughness an additional capability in the future. <clears throat> and then we looked at the compliant surface with this roughness force flow, and first characterized that unforced surface response, 
And we use that to confirm that indeed we are eliciting this surface response to the synthetic load that we're putting in. We do have the interaction that we we're looking for. And we were able to interpret this interaction as the elastic surface opposing the V velocity near the wall. And what we've also done is experimentally demonstrated the efficacy of a compliant wall resolving framework. I'd like to give a couple comments on resolvent analysis, which at the beginning is really just airing out dirty laundry. There's tons of assumptions that go into this. Um, and so we, for the compliant wall model, we've assumed that the deformations are in the wall normal direction only. We have the wall dynamics being modeled by a spring damper back plate. We've linearized the boundary condition. And then we assume that the material is purely elastic. On top of that, we use the code for a channel geometry as opposed to a turbulent boundary layer which has flow development. So we've made an assumption of parallel flow. The domains in X and Z are inherently infinite for the resolvent analysis. They are definitely not downstairs. Um, and then we use this uncontrolled numerically generated mean instead of somehow folding in the mean from our experiments. On top of this, we have very limited inputs. This is just to highlight. So the only things we put in from the experiment were the wave number from our synthetic structure and then the wall admittance of our material. Again, we could have done something with our mean velocity, but instead we chose to do this numerically generated mean. So given all these assumptions and these limited inputs, the resolvent modes still were able to qualitatively capture many of the features we saw in this experimental mode. For example, Again, that dual peak structure, the phase jumps, the tall structure in V, um, the qualitative match is quite good. And what it enabled us to do is predict some very subtle feature that might have otherwise been missed, this virtual wall that occurred so near the wall. Um, and it allowed us to make a connection to a different type of flow control mechanism in opposition control. So I think given all the assumptions that went into it, the resolvent analysis was still a very useful tool in analyzing this data. So finally, for a bit of future work, on the side of dynamic roughness, we have here looked at the two-dimensional roughness element in 2D perturbation. Um, so naturally, one could try to consider a three-dimensional element, and that's because turbulence is a naturally three-dimensional phenomenon. One could also more optimize the PID for near-wall measurement, um, and that could enable some optical wall shear stress measurements, which could allow you to get, well, wall shear stress measurements with the synthetic structure, which I think would be a interesting dimension to add to the literature. Um, with the compliant surface, there have been some improvements that can be made in the molding process, which I've identified in the thesis. And this could lead to a smoother surface geometry and make a more robust analysis. One could also consider a more complex material, so viscoelastic materials, consider the effect of damping and some other material properties. And then following the green mechanism, one could look at a two-frequency actuation form which essentially excites two different synthetic structures where they interact in the flow, but then also could be interacting with the surface and look at this incredibly rich system. And then finally, looking at the resolvent analysis, you can definitely think about what kind of interpolation scheme would allow you to consider the experimentally modified mean, and this would allow you to fold in the effect of the dynamic roughness as well as the compliant surface. One could look into the spring damper back plate boundary condition and look to model this in a more accurate viscoelastic material model and look to see if the predictions improve. <clears throat> and also look to account for other deformation components. So we here focus on the y, but we also have the streamwise and uh, spanwise deformations too. And finally, this is really sort of zooming out to the future of the resolvent, but there are some people in our group who are looking into how you can model the scale interaction. So instead of just looking at 1k, <clears throat> you can look at the interaction of multiple k's, essentially looking to close this feedback, loop, which would really further resolvent analysis as a predictive and, and um, powerful tool. <clears throat> OK, with that, I would like to conclude the technical component of this thesis defense. Um, and I absolutely could not have done this without the support of a lot of people, so I'd like to go through some acknowledgments now. I want to thank my thesis committee, um, Maury, Dale, and Robbie. They have cont all contributed to my work through their questions at my candidacy exam and Tuesday talks and through the classes that they've taught and through personal interactions. I, I really appreciate their expertise and their time. Um, it's very valuable. And of course, I want to thank my advisor, Beverly, 
um, for her knowledge and her, for her support and also endless patience. Um, somehow, I think I got super lucky and I think Beverly was basically the perfect advisor for me. I think she's been endless support and found this incredible balance of letting me beat my head against a wall so that I can figure something out that I need to, but also not letting me marinate in hopelessness for too long. <laughs> And um, I, I really appreciate it. And uh, she's been an excellent mentor and role model. And I really hope to emulate her example as I move forward in my career and in my life. Um, and she's going to come up later, so that's all I'm going to say now. <clears throat> I also want to thank the Gelson Machine Shop, Joe and Stephanie and Ali um, and Matt. They've been really excellent. Not only have they helped make, or they just have made this experiment, but they helped make this experiment good and also make it physically possible. Apparently they care about that with machine stuff, um, but they've really been an excellent group, super fun, very happy to help out and help me learn a lot along with it. So I really appreciate it. Um, the gas and staff has been really wonderful. So Jimmy is retired now, but Christine and Peggy also have just been super wonderful taking care of me and really this department, all the grad students have been really awesome. Um, and I'm glad they were able to take some of the administrative stress off my plate. I was very happy for that, so I want to say thank you to them. Um, the Caltech Base 11 collaboration has just been a massive influence on my graduate career. So I want to thank a lot of people for this. Foster and Coco Sandback for establishing the fellowship so generously. Um, Robbie and Beverly have served as the, the Gossett leadership for this program, and Dimity and Jamie have been the Gossett staff supporting it. Um, the Base 11 team, Landon, Ingrid, and Christine are the ones I've worked with most closely, but all the people at Base 11 are really incredible. And then I've had the good fortune of working with a bunch of awesome uh, graduate mentors too. So Arnold, Brian, Brian Kong, and then later Option and Joel. Really, all these people have been really incredible. The amount of promotion and how much support they put in, making the day to day logistics happen, and just powering it with tireless effort. It's been really awesome to see what kind of change you can make when, when the right people come together. And then uh, at the core of this experience has really been the Base 11 students, some of whom are awesomely here today. Um, really, they came in from different schools and different backgrounds, different stages of life in general, but all came in with that same eagerness and enthusiasm to learn. It was really inspiring. Um, and it helped me appreciate just how meaningful and rewarding it can be to not be the main character of your own story, but be the supporting role in the narrative of someone else's journey. And it's a perspective that I, I really appreciate and I want to carry with me for the rest of my life. So to everybody who was part of this experience, I want to say a big thank you. Um, <laughs> onto the McKeon group. <laughs> Somehow work never felt like work, and that's only because we were sometimes not working. <laughs> um, and a few of them are hopefully watching the live stream now, but I, I want to thank all the graduate students who came before me, Jonathan, Kevin, Sean, Tessu, Esteban, and Reeve, all the graduate students who joined after, Ryan, Simon, Mason, Morgan, and Ben, all the postdocs that I've had the good fortune of overlapping with, Mitchell, Rashad, Scott, and Lucy, and we need Arzlan and Jane. Um, and then, of course, the lifeblood of the group, <laughs> Beverly and Jamie and Denise. This is just a really incredible bunch of people. I mean, whatever, super intelligent and capable is kind of just the baseline, I would say. They're awesome in so many other respects. They have a ton of fun. They're also so willing to help and support each other, um, both like in theoretical ways. I go to people for math help all the time, but then also physically, it helped me put the plate into the tunnel more times than I can count. <clears throat> so literally happy to help me with the heavy lifting. Um, it's just been really incredible, and I'm going to miss this group a bunch. Um, and I have to give a special shout out to Jamie um, for dealing with my most unhinged state of McMaster orders that I will ever achieve in my life, somehow handling everything that she does and me without skipping a beat. It's just incredible. And uh, Denise came in and did a really great job taking over for her. And they've both been super awesome friends. It's just been a, a ton of fun. And um, I don't know, I'll never stop believing that Beverly has some 
master plan here when she accumulates various people. Uh, but whatever it is, I, I think this group has been really excellent. And I think the, the chemistry has been a wonderful thing to be a part of. So I want to say thank you to my group. <clears throat> okay, a few quick Caltech shout outs. I want to thank the G1 class um, for sticking it out in that year one, which was so much fun. Uh, I would really want to thank the Cal State Intermural team, but don't ask us about our name, please. Um, I want to thank the folks over at the CTLO, especially Jen and Weaver, who's been really instructive over the years. And I also absolutely want to thank the folks at the Arizona I got lunch there just this afternoon, and uh, yeah, they, they got me happy in bed for a number of years. So it's been wonderful. Campus has been really great to me. Um, and of course, moving off campus, we were able to hang out with our group and a bunch of other people, but there was sort of a, a core gang that we saw really frequently, and so hopefully they're, they're watching or will be watching at some point. I want to thank Arturo, Jason, Susie, uh, Nathan, Noah, and also Sal and Mike through board games and cooking together and getting dinner out and going to Vegas and going to the beach. And, getting into some trouble and things like that. These people have made life outside of classes and outside of work really wonderful for us. And I could not imagine my time without it. So I want to thank them for that. And now, moving a bit closer to home, naturally, I absolutely have to thank my family for supporting me for my entire life. My dad and my mom have been just incredible support from the get-go. I always felt like I could do anything, and uh, they enabled me to take advantage of all the opportunities that I was going to get and set a really excellent example for me, um, and I, I wouldn't be here without that. Um, and then to my sister Amanda and my brother Benji, I definitely know that I would not be the person that I am today if I was not their brother growing up. <clears throat> it's been really excellent, and uh, I really value the fact that they're able to be here with me today for this defense. It's really awesome. And, I owe a lot, of, a lot of who I am and where I am today to that. And then, <laughs> as our family grows bigger, I want to also thank my mom, who might also be watching, my mother-in-law, for being so warm and welcoming to the family. Um, um, I have just been super supportive and patient. I really do that. So it's been great. It's always good to have her family. And then, most importantly, Oh no, 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 no. <laughs> <laughs> it, had, it had to happen here. It had to. So, <clears throat> absolutely, I need to thank my wife, Nikki, for being an endless source of love and support throughout all of these years out here. Um, she's been super helpful in taking care of me, and I know that that has 100% not been easy all the time because. When we moved out here, she had to deal with job stress and proper adult stress with a real job and no support network. And on top of that, my graduate stress became her stress because she would stay up when I had a late night at lab to make sure I got home safe, to make sure I ate, and to make sure I slept. And so she really, she's done a lot to enable me to uh, pursue this PhD. And I really appreciate it. Um, but on top of that, she's my best friend. And doing anything is always better when we can do it together. When we hang out with friends or when we travel, and the little things like doing chores together is, is always fun. Um, and so I want to thank you for everything, babe. It's been awesome. And we've been through a bunch of adventures together. <laughs> We're about to embark on a very different one, but Timmy didn't say that. <laughs> <laughs> we are expecting a baby boy in May and in fact, this has, I have to thank him, of course, for being that extra motivation that I needed to <laughs> finish up this whole time. <laughs> I definitely didn't need that extra stress. <clears throat> but his, his due date is exactly one month from today, so I know he's going to be a handful. As I finish my thesis, he's going to finish becoming a human. He's not even sure yet, and he already wants to race his dad. So <laughs> I, I know he's going to be trouble. He's going to be the best kind. Um, so I'm really excited to start this new adventure with my family. OK, and with that, I want to thank all of you for your attention, and I'll happily take any questions you have.
Okay, so <coughs> you mentioned uh, possibly again working at the two frequency yeah. representation. What about a, a random, totally random uh, white noise excitation? What could you do it? Does, does it make sense? Oh, um, do you mean experimental? Yeah. <coughs> so with the Bose motor, it is able to do a lot. You can generate sort of almost arbitrary waveform, but I would be concerned, from an experimental perspective, I'd be concerned that if you wanted that white noise to be of an appreciable amplitude, the motor may not be able to handle that kind of dynamic load. Um, so in that sense, it, it could be challenging. Also, I guess one advantage of exciting a particular, and in fact, sort of um, non-naturally occurring synthetic structure is that it's much easier to decouple it from, from everything else in the flow. And I guess if you had some sort of white noise signal, that might get a little bit more challenging. Um, yeah. So you could perhaps do a different excitation mechanism, but I think this motor in particular, it's designed for yeah, that. Okay, okay, so suppose you could do it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Is it good? Is it, an, is it an idea? Um, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I guess you might then want to change the questions that you're asking. So here, uh, for example, what Subu was able to do is you know exactly what you're putting in, and with these well-defined instructors, you can study something like triadic interaction. Here, we have something similar, where we know exactly what we're putting in, so we can decouple the rest of the surface response to that flow mode. Right. With something like a, a white noise maker, um, I guess you would be asking something different. You'd be looking again at the broadband response of this system. Um, and I, I mean, you could do that, but I, I'm not sure. I'd have to think a little bit more about what you what that would like to do from like a modeling perspective, versus if you just let the turbulent boundary layer do do what it wants. Yeah, this okay. I can because the turbulence itself produces some noise. Exactly right. So I think again, decoupling these things uh, would be a challenge, and then you have to think about what it is that you want to get out of that kind of forcing. <clears throat> Can the dog fun decide between white noise versus what we do? Ah, good question. No. So the dolphin it, it's first of all, let's suppose that the dolphin skin is acting in a passive manner. So it's not actively exerting energy to like make these ripples. These are ripples that occur due to the interaction with the flow. And because of that, the dolphin doesn't really get to condition its flow in any particular way. So you get some perhaps shear generated instability waves in the flow regime of the dolphin, and then it would be sort of an evolutionary process to select a material that has the right compliance to mitigate whatever the drag reducing mechanism is. So short answer is the dolphin doesn't get to condition its flow super well. Um, that's actually a different kind of flow control scheme that has been explored. So they looked at with some ships, they looked at injecting polymers at the hull of the ship to reduce drag reduction. And that's a way that you can sort of do something to the surrounding flow, but dolphins, I don't think, have access to something like that. So the dolphin is neutral. <laughs> <laughs> neutral in what sense? <clears throat> doesn't decide which way. Yeah, dolphin, it, it doesn't. The skin may do something to benefit its flow. In fact, there, there was a great deal of controversy about Kramer's results. And there's a really great line in the Oxford View paper that says, um, what is it, that experiments in compliant surfaces, sloppy experiments in compliant surfaces do not work. He says that like almost verbatim in this review, which just kind of highlights the fact that a bunch of people tried to replicate his studies and found very different results. You can get super different results depending on the exact nature of this compliant surface um, and things like that. But anyway, there were eventual studies that came out that actually supported Kramer's hypothesis that maybe the dolphin skin is actually helping it reduce drag, although in a different way than what I talked about here. Um, likely what the dolphin is doing is preventing the onset of instability waves through its surface compliance. So basically it maintains laminar flow for longer. 
um, and prevents the flow from transitioning. So it reduces drag in that way. Um, yeah, that's a long answer to a simple question. <laughs> Who's going to let it off here? Oh, okay. All right. So thank you, uh, David. Uh, we'll take a couple minutes break and we'll go to Thank you very much.